good to be in the Lord, good to be back in the Lord's house tonight. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Second Samuel chapter 9. We're going to speak about David's interaction with a young man named Mephibosheth. How many of you have you ever heard about Mephibosheth? All right, so we're going to talk about him tonight. Second Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show him the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is a cripple. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, saw, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land that of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given your master's grandson. And you and your servants, you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that the Lord, my lord the king commands his servants, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate <clears throat> always at the king's table. Now he was lame in both his feet. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for loving us. For Christ Jesus' sake, Father, we pray as we look into your word tonight that you would be glorified, that you would teach us and help us to see the gospel through this story. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, the story of Mephibosheth. We find ourselves at the beginning of the story uh, in the palace of King David in Jerusalem. But David, and we, we have to understand the back story, David hadn't always been in the palace. David, as we know from studying from the life of David, hearing Bible stories, reading what the Word of God tells us, David had his beginnings in the sheep field, tending to, to sheep. That's what he did. That's what he did for his father. His father owned sheep. He tended his father's sheep. We know that God moved him from there to killing a giant, from killing a giant to uh, having charge over the army of King Saul, the, the army of Israel. And then from there, his... Uh, popularity, popularity began to grow to the point to where Saul, the king, became jealous of David and began to try to kill him and want to kill him. And David fled for his life. And for years, David fled while, da while, while Saul chased him in the wilderness trying to kill him. There was several times when David uh, had the opportunity to kill Saul but did not. But before all of this happened, David had a friend. And David's friend was Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of, of Saul. 
the son of King Saul. So David and Jonathan were best friends. They were like brothers. And they made a pact with one another. They made a covenant with one another that if either one of them died, that the other would take care of his family. And his family all the days of their life, as best as he could, he would take care of them. So now David had been running from Saul. And we understand there come a day when Saul and Jonathan went out to war and both Saul and Jonathan were killed in the battle. Well, after this happened, David ascended to the throne of Israel and become king. And now all of his enemies basically had been defeated. Not all of his enemies. David still fought wars. They still fought battles. And really David was a warrior king to where his son Solomon, Solomon would eventually have a very peaceful reign. So David was fighting wars. But we find that, that David was finally in that place of where when he was a child God told him you would be king over Israel through the prophet Samuel. David was there. David was reigning. David was ruling. David was exactly where God wanted him to be. But David remembered something. David remembered a covenant that he made with his best friend. That if Jonathan died or if David died, whoever died first, the other would take care of their family. And David remembered that. He remembered that promise. He remembered that covenant. And now he wanted to make good with it. So as far as he knew, there was a possibility that all the family of Saul and Jonathan had been destroyed, had been killed. And so he called someone who he knew was a servant of the house of Saul. And he asked, is there anyone left? Is there anybody left in your family? Is there anybody left in the family who you served that, that I can bless? And Ziba says, there is one. His name is Mephibosheth. Now, I want us to stop here, and now I want us to go to Mephibosheth. What, who is Mephibosheth? The name Mephibosheth means from the mouth of shame. The Bible tells us that Mephibosheth lived in a city called Lodabar. Lodabar's the name meant no pasture or no word. Basically, studying about the place of Lodabar, it was the ghetto. It was, it was the wrong side of the tracks. It was the place where nobody wanted to go. It was the poor side of town. And that's where uh, Mephibosheth lived. Well, what was going on in Mephibosheth's life? We know that his grandfather was the king of Israel. His father, Jonathan, was the prince, the soon-to-be king, or possible soon-to-be king. How did he get into this shape? Well, the story is told in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, that his nurse was taking care of him when he was a child, I believe five years old. And then word came to this nurse that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in the battle. And when this took place, the nurse understood something. She knew the next place they were coming was her house where Mephibosheth was, this young prince, because he is next in line for the kingdom. He's next in line for the throne. So she grabbed him and she began to run. And the Bible says she fell and when she fell it injured Mephibosheth and he became lame on both of his feet. He was a cripple. So when we look at this person Mephibosheth what we see is a nobody from nowhere who's crippled. And that's all we know really about Mephibosheth. He was a nobody. He was the lowest of society, even though his family name, he was supposed to be somebody, but he was a nobody. But also, what you need to understand, during this time, um, he was a part of the other family who was supposed to be king, and now there is a sitting king over Israel. What this means for Mephibosheth, now he doesn't know about the stories of David and Jonathan's friendship. He doesn't know uh, that, that David wants to bless him. He doesn't know that David wants to take care of him. All he knows, all Mephibosheth knows is he was the next in line for the throne and that he has an enemy and he is somebody's enemy who he don't want to be their enemy. He's David's enemy. Because he draws breath, there is a certain possibility that he could be a threat to David's throne because he was supposed to be king. And he knows that. And I'm sure that Mephibosheth is living every day. He lives in the, back, in the wrong part of town. He is laying on his feet and he's living with what he knows is a death sentence on his head at all times because of who he is. Not because he did anything, but because of who he is, he knows that in the eyes of the king, he probably deserves to die. 
So this is what he's living under. So here he is in Lodabar, lame on his feet, probably lying on a mat in the corner of the room, and all of a sudden he hears a knock at the door. And the door is open, and it's one of David's soldiers. I can imagine what went through Mephibosheth's mind. Here it is. The day has come. I'm finally going to die. David has caught up with me, and he's going to make sure that the entire line of Saul is destroyed forever. So he understands this is probably what's going to happen. And so the soldier takes Mephibosheth, puts him wherever he puts him, to, whether it's on a horse or in a chariot or whatever it may be, and they head towards Jerusalem. And I don't know what probably going through Mephibosheth's, Mephibosheth's mind at this point. Why wouldn't the soldier just have ended his life right there? Why is he taking him to see David? Maybe he thinks David wants to do it himself. Maybe David wants to end his life himself. So here Mephibosheth is, as far as he knows, on his way to die. Mephibosheth, the next scene, we see Mephibosheth in the throne room of David in his palace. And here David is the king in his kingly attire and his crown. However the, 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 the scene may look, there David is. And there Mephibosheth is a lame cripple. And all Mephibosheth hears is David say his name, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth responds, Behold, I am your servant. Maybe, just maybe, he'll let me live. And David said to him, Now I can imagine what Mephibosheth was expecting to hear at this point. I sentence you to death. I condemn you, an enemy of the state and an enemy of the kingdom, to die. But what did Mephibosheth hear? Behold, he heard this, Mephibosheth, the son of... Da I've lost my place. David said to him in verse 7, Do not fear. Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant? that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I. So here Mephibosheth is waiting to hear the sentence of death on his life. And instead, David says, do not fear. I'm showing you mercy. Why are you showing me mercy? Well, it's not because of Mephibosheth. Tonight in our uh, training union, we talked about God's faithfulness in spite of our unfaithfulness. Why was David going to show Mephibosheth mercy on this day? It had nothing to do with Mephibosheth. It had nothing to do with what he had done. It had nothing to do with what he could do for David. In fact, he could do nothing for David. And just the very fact that he was living was a threat to David's throne or could have been a threat to David's throne. But what David said was this, because of your father Jonathan, I'm showing mercy on you. What is David referring to? He's referring to the covenant that he made with Jonathan that he would take care of his family. Well, in the economy of God, in eternity past, God made a covenant. God made a covenant inside the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They made a covenant that they were going to save a group of people in time. That Jesus Christ was going to come and die for that group of people. The Holy Spirit was going to seal them to the day of redemption. And then you look at us, people who are sinners, people who are fallen human beings, people who are unlovable, people who do not deserve the grace of God, people who only deserve the wrath of God, and we stand before God and we know that what we deserve is his wrath what we deserve is his punishment and when we hear the words from God he says I'm giving you grace for Jesus' sake I'm giving you grace because Christ died for you I'm giving you grace because I so love the world that I sent my only son to die that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life so we like Mephibosheth are showed grace we're showed mercy because of a covenant that God made with Jesus what an amazing picture of grace this is Mephibosheth is blown away he, he doesn't even say well thank you he doesn't say what have I done he says why would you do this to a dead dog as I am he thought lowly of himself and he should have thought lowly of himself but grace had a different understanding 
And now we're, we're going to see the benefits of the covenant. King, the king called Ziba, Saul's servant. He says, you're going to take care of his land. You're going to tend his flock. Your servants are going to tend his, um, his, his garden. And then he says, but Mephibosheth is going to eat at my table as one of my sons. So what are the benefits of this relationship? What are the benefits of the spiritual relationship? Not only have we been forgiven, not only has the slate been wiped clean, and we've been made pure because of the righteousness of Christ, but now we are seated with Christ Jesus. As, as David allowed Mephibosheth to sit at his table as one of his sons, now we've been invited into the presence of God and adopted by him as one of his sons. We have all the full benefits of a child of God. When we call on him, he hears us. The Bible even says when we shed a tear, is he says, I have a bottle full of your tears. He remembers our tears. We have a God that sticks closer than a brother. He is ever present help in time of trouble. He is the friend that sticks closer than the brother. We know that's what he is for us. And we have this in Christ Jesus because of the covenant that was made for us. It's all because of Jesus. So one day when we stand before the throne of God, we won't have to say, have to ask God, well, did I do enough good to get here? We won't have to say, God, can I get here based on my parents' merit? What we'll be able to understand and, and hear him say is, well done, good and faithful servant. Why are we a good and faithful servant? Because of Christ Jesus. That's why. So we see the grace of God through Mephibosheth here. We see his grace displayed. And I think about, I heard another preacher say this. In fact, probably, probably four years ago when I first became pastor, one of the first revivals we had was with Brother Jimmy, he, Brother Jimmy Hill. He came and preached an evangelist from uh, uh, Soso, Mississippi. And I've heard him say this in the past. That, that, that he, he reminds us that Mephibosheth was a lame man and he was set apart from everybody else. He always looked different. He always, because he was crippled, he always looked different. But when he sat at the king's table and his legs were covered by the king's tablecloth, he looked no different than anybody else. That's how we are. Yes, we are sinful. We are unworthy. But when we come under the grace of God and when we're under his table, we look just like everybody else. We are forgiven. We are holy in Christ Jesus. That's the benefits of the sonship that we receive because of Jesus. Just like Mephibosheth was blessed for Jonathan's sake, we are blessed for Christ's sake. And we can be thankful. We can praise the Lord for that. Amen? It's good to be reminded about what Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you for giving us Christ Jesus. We thank you that... Even though we know what we deserve, we didn't get what we deserve. We receive grace and grace upon grace. And I thank you for that. Remind us, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.